Joining me now is Canada's Commissioner of the Environment and Sustainable Development, Jerry DeMarco. Thanks so much for being with us, Mr. DeMarco. Thanks for inviting me, Mike. I wanted to start by looking back at your last report in November. You took a wide view of where Canada is and how well some of our measures are working. Remind us where Canada sits right now in relation to hitting our targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So our target is to have at least 40% of a reduction vis-a-vis uh, -vis the 2005 level by 2030. And right now, with all the measures that uh, have been rolled out to date as of the date of our report, they aren't quite there. They're somewhere in the 30% uh, range, according to their own estimation. So they still have some work to do to complete the list of measures that would be needed to reach the 2030 target. Yeah, and in that report, you found that there are more than 80 policies and programs that are listed in that plan, but few of the, few than half of them actually have a timetable for implementation. How crucial is that timetable? Well, it's, it's incredibly important because Canada's history over the last three decades is continued failures to meet targets. So doing the same thing as we've done in the past, which is to have a laundry list of measures, but very little accountability for actually achieving the targets is not going to work if we just keep repeating that. So we need some timelines, specific targets, and clear pathways to reach those targets. Now, in 2022, you actually measured the effectiveness of carbon pricing. And part of that report said there was not enough publicly available information on the various large emitter programs to provide an understanding of the effectiveness of the systems. So are we able to measure how effective carbon pricing is in actually reducing greenhouse gas emissions? So the theory of carbon pricing is sound, and it's been around for almost a century, I guess, from the, uh, from the, uh, the uh, publication of the economics of welfare uh, back in the 1920s. So that's, the idea is to internalize uh, a cost such as pollution or secondhand smoke or plastic litter and so on, internalize that into the cost of the, uh, of the item being, being um, purchased, whether that's gasoline, natural gas for heating or so on. And so that theory is sound. The question is, mm -hmm. in implementing it, is it stringent enough to cause the changes that you're trying to make? And is it widely applied enough so as to have the, the full effect that is needed? We found in our audit two years ago that Canada had rolled out carbon pricing uh, as a good initial step, but there were definitely problems associated with it. And we made some recommendations to help them improve the effectiveness of carbon pricing in Canada. Have you seen whether or not they've acted on those recommendations yet? They've done some uh, actions to uh, to uh, bring in uh, improvements to the uh, to the carbon pricing system. They also promised that several of the other ones would only be dealt with at the next review of the carbon pricing system in 2026. So we'll have to wait and see how they do then. I, I had said that uh, we're dealing with a climate crisis. We should be acting more quickly than that. But uh, we do have to wait to see whether the results we're hoping for uh, happen on the ground in terms of the changes. Yeah, and there have been a lot of numbers tossed around recently, especially around carbon pricing. Even on this show, Adam Vancouverton, the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Environment, claimed that a third of emissions reduction in this country can be attributed to the price on carbon. Is that right? So Environment Canada estimates that approximately a third of the reductions it hopes to achieve by 2030 would be attributable to carbon pricing. So that's just their modeling and we haven't audited that. We can't say yay or nay on whether that's accurate or not. We do not know whether carbon pricing will uh, will remain as is. For now, it's supposed to go up every, every year by $15 and so on. If it does and the price becomes higher, the more effective it will be. It's like a dial. The stronger the price, mm -hmm. or the higher the price, the stronger the impact it is on the economy and on human behavior. And not to try and get into the politics of it all, because I know that, that that's not your realm, uh, but can you see how there is this sort of difficult dance being played out right now in the middle of this um, affordability crisis in terms of either turning up that dial or leaving where it is right now? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, in one of my first reports as commissioner a few years ago called Lessons Learned on Climate Change, we talked about how difficult it is 
to uh, manage you know, a long-term crisis like uh, climate change or biodiversity for that matter within the confines of a system that favors short-term thinking. And politics definitely favors short-term thinking. So that lesson that we talked about in terms of taking an intergenerational view and looking after not only our children, but the, our children's children, that's difficult to do in a political uh, forum that looks at what's happening today or maybe tomorrow or maybe the latest, the next election. So it is a challenge to, to marry good policy with, with the possible um, outcomes that are available in politics. Yeah, especially when those politicians have to go to the polls about every four years or so uh, to sort of renew that mandate. Uh, I know you spoke a little bit of, about, about this at the beginning of our conversation here, but the price on pollution and a price on pollution really is uh, what some politicians see as a key to tackling climate change. Is it the cornerstone that it should be of what Canada is saying is, is their, you know, their environmental policy? Should it be that sort of untouchable thing uh, that this government seems to make it to want it to be? Well, it is, it is considered an effective mechanism. And that's not, not just me saying that. That's the Supreme Court of Canada, the OECD, um, the International Monetary Fund, and so on. Everyone recognizes that an economic tool like cost internalization, or in this case, a carbon levy, is an efficient way of getting to the outcome that uh, that you're seeking. But it does have this difficulty of it sometimes being politically unpalatable. However, we do see that countries that adopted this early, say, for example, Finland in 1990 or Sweden in 1991, right around the time that the Climate Change Convention was being negotiated and ultimately signed in Brazil a year later, They've had carbon prices in place for decades now, and they've seen increased economic output, but decreased emissions. Canada has not had that history. We've seen increased economic output, but we've had an increase in emissions since the 1990s, and we're unique among the G7 countries in really failing to get a handle on bringing down greenhouse gas emissions. Carbon pricing is supposed to be one of the key measures to bring them down. Just just before I let you go, I wanted to ask you about that. So why is it that Canada hasn't seen that, excuse me, that benefit that Finland has or other countries in sort of that uh, cause and effect of, uh, you know, increasing the price on pollution and also seeing that output uh, and, the, and the reduction of emissions? Why has that not followed so far? Well, uh, conceptually, it's because of a lack of, of effective leadership in terms of actually hitting the targets that are in all of these plans that we've had for the last 30 years. But more concretely, it's it's a huge increase in in, uh, in pollution relating to oil and gas and transportation. Canada's those two sectors have dominated Canada's emissions for so long, and and their their relative. Uh, weight within Canada's emissions portfolio, if you want to call it that, has increased over time. So unless we get a handle on those sectors, we're not going to be able to bring down total emissions. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there for today. Canada's Commissioner of the Environment and Sustainable Development, Jerry DeMarco, thanks so much for being with us today.